the order, the quicker that some of us get to watch the three three three. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Jay Ash. I'm the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development for the Commonwealth. And uh, more importantly, I'm a North Shore resident. So uh, neighboring Danvers, so this is actually good. I don't have to drive three hours to get home tonight. Uh, all uh, thanks all for being here. This is the second of two listening sessions that we're having around the issue of dredging. Uh, so if I can give you a little bit of background uh, as to why we're all here. Uh, dredging, uh, to some people, is an environmental issue. And yet, I often hear, Jay, it's an economic development issue. And so what the uh, Secretary of Environmental Affairs and I have done is we've, uh, we have divided up a lot of the work that has cross-jurisdictional uh, opportunities. And um, I am taking on the dredging portion uh, of the combined work that we all do together. When I say we all do together, the Secretary of Transportation, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, and me, the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, uh, meet regularly. We meet every other week uh, to work on a joint uh, plan uh, for economic development, for transportation access, and for environmental protection. Um, and so uh, we share responsibilities in a lot of areas. Uh, we are taking the lead on dredging from housing and economic development, but it's in close consultation with environmental affairs. Um, in fact, uh, Bruce is here uh, representing the secretary, Bruce Carlisle, uh, who's the director of uh, Coastal Zone Management. Uh, so we will be doing things collaboratively, but for the purposes of making sure that somebody is in charge, uh, that somebody, uh, according to the governor, is me. Now, um, the governor gave me the opportunity to be in charge of dredging in part because I grew up in Chelsea. Uh, what I remind the governor is that uh, even though I lived there uh, for all of my formative life, I didn't know I lived in a waterfront community. <laughs> Andy has heard that many times. Andy DeSantis was my former DPW director. I was a city manager in Chelsea for 14 years, so uh, Andy was my DPW director. Uh, so uh, growing up in Chelsea, I would drive by places that I thought water was on the other side. There were oil tanks, there were salt piles. I never had access to the water. Uh, but nonetheless, the governor said, uh, you grew up in a waterfront community, so it's great that you'll be in charge of dredging. Now, you grown up in a waterfront community, I need your help to figure out what dredging is all about. Uh, when Chelsea ever talked about dredging, we just talked to Massport. Massport talked to the Army Corps of Engineers, and everything was dredged. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Cahill, thank you for having us here today. Absolutely. Oh, very good. Um, so um, the reason for these uh, opportunities to have kind of an informal chat, I know there's a lot of people here, but this is kind of an informal chat for me, uh, is for you to help me understand what our priorities should be about dredging. So what we have been doing is we've been hearing from lots of people. We've been visiting some of those lots of people, uh, including Manchester by the Sea. Um, in talking about um, uh, dredging that has been uh, deferred, postponed, not done for decades, if not for generations, if not for longer than generations. Uh, we do not believe that we're going to catch up in one year or two years or three years as much as we'd like to. Um, so we need to think about how to prioritize the dollars that we have in order to uh, make the most efficient use of the dollars we have and to, to help all of you uh, do what you want to do in terms of uh, dredging our particular areas. Um, the good news is that we have more dollars today to spend on dredging than we did last year. Uh, so what the governor has said, um, and it's in cooperation with legislature, the numbers, number of legislators who are here, the governor has said in cooperation with the legislature is that uh, we want to prioritize dredging. That's the good news. The bad news is I can't give all of you a grant this year to do your dredging. Uh, so we're going to start to think about how we might prioritize dredging to get the most bang out of our buck, uh, number one. Number two, um, we no longer write blank checks. So uh, Andy, I don't know if you were at this event, but I was a city manager at Chelsea, and I had a contaminated piece of land in Chelsea. Now, I know many of you are thinking, Jay, you had a contaminated piece of land in Chelsea? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> The answer is yes, I had a contaminated piece of land in Chelsea. As I stood there and watched the federal government giving Chelsea three and a half million dollars, the state government giving us a half a million dollars to clean up a piece of land that now has a hotel on it that contributes $600,000 a year in revenues to the city, 
I thought how strange it was that the federal government in its budget difficulties, the state government in its budget difficulties, and the city of Chelsea that was running great surpluses, the city wasn't being asked to put anything up to the table. So our commitment is we're going to spend more than we have spent, but we're also going to ask you to participate as well. It's a partnership. Partnership is we're going to help you improve your communities, which helps us improve the Commonwealth. But we're not writing any <coughs> checks, and we're not writing 100% checks uh, to do those types of things. As we go through this process, we would like to think about how we can um, convince each other that the partnership is a long-term partnership. And by that, we would like to know what standards you'd be willing to be held to and then hold you to those standards, just as you will hold us to standards of, Jay, if we do A, B, and C, to take it from Manchester's example, for instance, if you do A, B, and C, we expect you to show up uh, with your share of the check. And we're prepared to do that. Um, that's the way that we operate now. In Chelsea, we have the slogan, you plan the work, and then you work the plan. We're in the planning phase now of how to plan the work that will allow us to come out to communities and work your plan to get dredging done. So uh, for tonight's purposes, uh, I would love to hear from you um, not so much about the uh, specific need. I need you know, $10 million to do this dredging in this area of my community. As much as the, the kind of the overarching uh, need your community has for dredging. Is it an economic development issue or an environmental issue? Uh, what do you think? Help us prioritize. You know, should we be thinking about uh, commercial areas first, areas that are going to uh, grow commercially, that are going to add to the tax base, that are going to create jobs, that are going to help companies that are already um, in the community, uh, stay in the community? Um, should it be about things like beach uh, renourishment? Um, should it be strictly environmental issues? Should it be something else? Should it be about water transportation? Um, should it be about opening up uh, shell fishing beds that don't exist? Uh, things like that would be very helpful. Uh, it would be helpful to hear about the problems that you may be having in terms of raising funds locally uh, to, um, to contribute to your dredging uh, issues. Um, are you raising funds locally? Do you have mooring fees? Do you have uh, uh, other fees? And are you contributing those to uh, the dredging activities that uh, you want to undertake? Um, love to hear about those. Love you to help me understand more about uh, what we should be doing for any town, put in the name before the town, any town, um, as opposed to specifically our town. Help me create the, uh, the uh, proposal that we will take back to the governor um, for every city and town uh, of the Commonwealth, not just yours. And um, you should know that we've already had the one other meeting, uh, very well attended on the South Shore in Plymouth, uh, and uh, two pages, three pages of notes, we've already gone through those. Uh, we hope to hear lots of the same things, but we also uh, hope to hear some things that are different. Um, I may stop if I'm uh, hearing the same things over and over again and throw out a question, a question that we didn't have answered in the last session, uh, so that um, I can make sure that we get a full uh, packet of information that we need, a full uh, understanding of, of the issues that you're facing in order to go back and uh, do the, um, uh, dredging that we, uh, the dredging work that we need to do with the, with the government. Uh, Mary Cahill, this is your uh, home here. Would you like to say anything, or would you like to uh, kick off the conversation? I just welcome everybody here. Uh, you know, we do have things we want to share about our uh, our long-held hope to dredge the Bass River, but I think we have people in Italy who are more versed in where things are right now, both in you know, the planning department there and our planning director, as well as some of the folks from our Harbor Management Authority. So maybe, since you've asked me, why don't I, why don't I turn over to, the, to them? See if Don or Aaron or anybody else wants to share a couple of thoughts about the Bass River. So uh, as, uh, Aaron, as uh, Aaron is getting ready to come up and talk, um, a lot of people here want to hear from everybody, uh, but we have a football game to see too. So um, I'd ask you to be concise if you could. Um, I'd ask you not to repeat, uh, especially if you're uh, from the same community. I, I'd ask for one representative from the community. Um, I'd ask you. Um, be flexible enough that I may go around the room depending upon what people's schedules are or, or if I want to pursue a particular uh, topic. Um, and know that we'll try to get uh, as many people in as we can. Um, if you have to leave at any time, uh, just find me on the internet, uh, easy enough on uh, mass.gov, and um, let me know what's going on. Or talk to your reps. There's a number of state reps here uh, today. Talk to your reps who are uh, talking to me. And frankly, the reason why the governor um, has charged uh, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs and me with coming up with a strategy is because y'all legislators have been saying to the governor, we need a strategy. 
That's the way we work. We've got a bipartisan uh, relationship, uh, Republican to governor, Democratic, we control the legislature. Working together, we bring up issues of, of public policy and then we figure out ways uh, to work together to get them done. So y'all legislators have been asking us, uh, what's the strategy? And uh, hopefully soon uh, we're gonna have that strategy and we'll have the money to then back it up. So, Aaron, go right there. Thank you, sir. If I could, before Aaron talks, just some of the, we heard you say that it's not just about any given project, but how does that, how does that extend out to putting together some uh, some guidelines and priorities? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Bass River, it's, we have commercial fishermen who rely on it, we have recreational boaters who rely on it. We have a stretch of the Bass River that is targeted for hopefully a significant transmarine development, mixed use redevelopment, which is 10 feet from a busy commuter location. And I know that we've been working on uh, certain of the permitting, both upper half and lower half of the river, and there are timelines and deadlines uh, for the validity of that work that's been done. So you know, I know these guys have more of the details, so Aaron? Yeah, just uh, kind of ditto. Um, to, to be concise, we, we look at the Bass River areas as one of our primary economic development opportunities um, in terms of transit-oriented development, and we see uh, improving access to the Bass River for both commercial and recreational boaters as a key component to that. Um, we, we feel particularly on the recreational side, um, adding um, access for recreational boating is a part of that economic development vision. Um, there are a number of uh, recreational facilities and, and commercial facilities that, facilities that are there now that um, it, unless we do some dredging, um, it's, it's not too far in the future that we expect that, that, that it's no longer going to be capable. So it's kind of preservation of access to the water for commercial and recreational. It's part of an economic development vision. The other component to that too is it gives us as a city in working with National Grid a great opportunity to do some significant cleanup of the river. So there's, there's some you know, VOCs and other contaminants in the river that uh, dredging in partnership um, with National Grid will kind of clean that up. So I think there's an economic development component to this, there's an environmental uh, component to it, and then just public access and, uh, and enjoyment in the, of the river. Um, the gentleman from the HMA here, the Harbor Management Authority, could talk about the specific components to it, but I don't think that's necessarily what you're looking for. All I would say is that we've been working for the last eight to 10 years, is that fair? Eight to 10 years on the permitting, so through the MEPA process we have, uh, it's a two-phase dredging process north of the bridge of, of the Bass River is already permitted and we're working right now and hopefully finalizing the, uh, the permitting with Army Corps in the next two to three months. And of course, the next big question is, is funding it. So, um, you know, I think from my perspective, um, economic development's key, environmental um, benefit improvement, uh, public access and commercial um, access to the waterways, uh, and then also something that's quote unquote shovel ready, something that could be done in the near term. All right, so my job is to ask you really tough questions now to put the fair and everybody else will come up and say, she's going to ask me tough questions. <laughs> uh, I, one, I want to congratulate you on the job preservation work. That's good, eight to 10 years. You kept your job, that's, that's good. We'll get another, another 10 years and pay too well. <laughs> um, so what I, what I hear from many communities is that there's a commercial benefit uh, to doing dredging. And when I think of commercial benefit, I think of local tax dollars. And when I think of local tax dollars, I think of putting up some local tax dollars in order to gain local tax dollars on the road, one local tax dollars on the road. You talk about, um, you know, we're, we're doing the plan and then we're gonna figure out how to fund it. What, what has Beverly done before in terms of investing in dredging? Um, and have you done any studies or anything that would suggest that you need to do such and such every year or five years or 10 years and how much that might cost in order to uh, not be coming at, at, at one of these meetings 10 years from now saying, oh my God, we can't get any boats in a row. Right. Um, so, the last the last yeah, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so there in, so 50, 50 years ago, the last stretch. 1947. 1947 would be 70 years ago, so. Uh, so um, here it is our problem, right? Uh, Every community has a story like this. It's been 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, or 70 years. And we're not gonna catch up. I wanna make sure that I set people's expectations. We're not gonna catch up in a year or two or three, right, with all those, but we are committed to trying to figure that out. So, you drive local revenue. Do you have, do you have moorings? Do you have other revenues that you get? Correct, yes, in Norway. You put commercial activities that depend upon the water. <laughs> right. um, those monies come into the uh, city. 
Um, are you spending money, are you putting aside money for a dredging project, or are you going to be looking to and the state yeah. and, and well, well, while I have some gentlemen from the HMA coming up. Essentially, money is put into a fund, a revolving fund that is used for waterfront development and improvement. So not necessarily dredging, but the yeah. mooring fees, uh, not the river, but the, the marina fees, and the waterway improvement fund money that comes to that goes into a segregated or evolving fund for waterfront improvement. Yeah, okay. And waterfront improvements could be fixing docks. Seawalls. Seawalls, sea marinas. Um, but you haven't used it for dredging because you you haven't been ready for dredging or you've had other priorities for money? I think a little both. If, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's, I think it's, it's a little bit of... Right. We also needed it permitted. We needed to get it permitted so it wasn't ready. So there was a lot of work. There's been a lot of investment in getting it ready for a dredge. Yeah. Um, I think there's been over a couple hundred thousand dollars that has been spent towards permitting to get it ready for that. Okay. But I also would say that, you know, a lot of the investment, it's been a couple million dollars on the harbor front. So the marina, the wharf was reconstructed. So there's been a, there's a lot of need and it's kind of an, it's a, a, an element of prioritizing need and also the kind of the price tag. I mean, some of these things are smaller lists. Yeah, what do you, you think, kind of, you have an idea of what, what do you think is? Or anyone, do you have an idea of what you're talking about? Some sort of number? Well, as, as, as Aaron said, the, the city and the local Bass Haven has put in over 300,000 right. so far yeah. to get the permit. The actual dredging is something under five million. Right. Okay. Something, I like some, something under five million. That's, yeah, that's an exact <laughs> science. Well, I'll give you something under five million. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. What, I, what I'd like to suggest is this not river like the infrastructure in the sense that it's been not repairable for the last, I can remember when that, when that steam driven boat was down in the basin, I'm just that old, I find that I'm uh, uh, sitting up here talking like the old guy. I remember when, <laughs> but the river has changed. And it's filled in. I'm fortunate to sit next to the premier Massachusetts fishing field, the bottles. So they have a vested interest. In, but what I'm saying, I see eagles and ospreys. I see a change in the river. No more the Russian crabs. The smell don't yeah, come in yeah. there. That's a regional pro uh, yeah. problem. The founder don't come in. But what I want to say is we're talking cost factors. And I want to step up to the point where do we let the river die? Right. I mean, that's. You can save money, and I know bridges. I was a construction worker all my life. The people will give me the finger. We're working on the bridge. It's the middle of the winter. And I'm saying to myself, okay, let's go home. Let them deal with it. So what I want to say, we have to deal with this situation in a sense. It's like Jeffrey, he's the next generation. He's not going to be able to use that waterway. And from what I understand, it's a cave and a refuge. And I can remember in Carol, in uh, Diane, there were folks from inner city park all the way up to what was the lumber yard at the time tied up. So it has that designation as well in the economics of the situation. Thanks. So um, so it's uh, Maritime Highway, was that what we heard the last time? So uh, last meeting somebody got up on the New Bedford guy and he said, you know, it's a Maritime Highway. I think about our roadways. You know, when they're roadways, yes? <laughs> I always recognize somebody with a hand up, so I thought maybe I made a mistake. No. Okay. Um, so, um, maritime, uh, maritime highways, when I think of our roadways, we make sure that we have capital investments and we have regular plans. And um, I'm struck that we've had, had 70 years and we, don't have a, uh, we haven't had anything done. Um, looking forward to having a conversation with the community about how we can uh, cost share. Um, need to understand if there is any federal uh, money available and if it's a federal uh, channel or a uh, property we need to uh, be able to do that and also interested in if the private sector is contributing anything in those will all be factors that we would think about um, another thing that we're thinking about is after we do it we want to know what your plan is to then maintain it right so it shouldn't be that we get it done this year and then that somebody has to wait 70 more years and you'll be telling stories I remember seven years ago when I was at uh, City Hall and they said they were going to do it regularly. I'm hoping I make it to tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's what we're thinking about. Right. Now, my name is John Hayes. I'm the co-chairman of the uh, Bass Haven Yacht Club Trading Committee. Okay. And I'd like to address some funding that you talked about. Sure. Co-funding. Um, 
taxpayer money all the time I'm talking about. The city of Beverly applied for um, Seaport Advisory uh, Group money. Yeah, Seaport Council, uh, Seaport Economic Council money. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the previous. Seaport previous, okay. What was the name of it? You know, if you want to get up, uh, by the way, folks, uh, cable TV, Beverly Cable TV is carrying this. If you want to get up and be heard on the microphone, go right ahead. I'm not going to force you to do that. I think I can talk about it. Uh, if you want to step to the microphone, then. okay. Good. Yep. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, um, life and money, yeah. we got involved on it in in the uh, project early on. Um, the Seaport Advisory Council had given Beverly, the City of Beverly, enough money to get the permitting, the study, all the study work done, and then at that point in time, it was sitting on a shelf someplace. Yeah. So we went into the mayor's office, and we tried to make a deal with the mayor to try to. Um, split the cost to continue on getting the permitting done, okay? Now we have, the Bass Haven Yacht Club, we have our own dredge fund yep. that would be contributed. You're looking for contributions to help out with this stuff. We're willing to do it. Yeah, we would, well, we, what we did from that point on, the mayor turned down our idea about 50-50 for the rest of the project. Yep. So we took the whole project on to get the, to keep the permitting going. And we brought it right up until we had a permit. We actually have a permit, the city of Beverly does, to do north of the bridge. Okay. Now, the the people that we're dealing with, people like you, the previous people like you, uh, they, 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 wanted, they wanted us to divide the river in, two, in the phase one, phase two. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, the city and the engineering firm and the only people that were involved in this thing, they said, okay, let's do that because that's what the, they want us to do. So we moved ahead. We got the permitting all done for phase one. We get the Army Corps of Engineering permit. The reason they wanted to split it was because of the problem with National Grid with the contaminated material that they have <coughs> down there. So that got split up. So the Seaport Advisory Authority gave the city money to go ahead and finish up the permitting for phase two. Well, they got it almost all done. Um, we, in, 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 and then all of a sudden they said, well, let phase one, let that permit expire and we'll take and we'll issue you one permit for the whole river. This is the Army Corps of Engineers now. So right now everything is done. The tier one assessment is complete yeah. in the Permit is ready to be issued by the Army Corps of Engineers. I don't w know what's taking it up. Uh, the so problem. permit's ready to go, but uh, do you know who's paying for what? Well, now that would be, that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's why I asked that question. The Bass Haven Yacht Club has already contributed over $100,000 towards the permitting. Yeah. The, the other taxpayers from through the state had contributed about 200000 or maybe more than two hundred. Yeah. So there's been $300,000 contributed yeah. of taxpayer money already. And yeah. I say taxpayer, some of it came from the private sector. Yeah, I got you. So the private sector, the Bass Haven Yacht Club, is still willing to work with the city and whoever to keep this thing going. Our Yacht Club has- I'm gonna, one, ask you, I'm gonna ask you to finish up. Okay, that. our Yacht Club has at one time had uh, uh, five or six feet of water at low tide. Yeah. Today it has zero. In the name of the Bass River, the, why do you think the Bass River was called the Bass River? Uh, the shoe company. Exactly. <laughs> Just like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, lots of good things there. And um, uh, so what we would expect from a municipality is uh, discussion about um, what the municipality would contribute and what other sources uh, you may bring in. What we would expect from a municipality is uh, a discussion about what the long-term uh, benefit is of dredging. We're not going to dredge just for the sake of dredging. There needs to be some benefit, whether it be commercial or, or recreational or environmental. Uh, we would expect um, a maintenance plan uh, that would then talk about uh, what somebody is going to do, what the community is going to do from this point forward uh, to be able to maintain something so it gets done every 10 years or 20 years, or whatever the uh, cycle would be. Um, so that, that will be uh, important. And, to the extent that you guys are spending, you're willing to spend, you have spent, that's all great. Um, so very helpful. All right, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go this way first and then this way first. 
Um, so uh, Jamie, you can be next. I want to introduce some people that are here. I'm going to go this way first. Then this way. No, you're not. Uh, first row. First row. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Senator Long, please stand. Thank you, Senator. Um, by the way, legislators have told me they want to hear from you. Um, so ordinarily, I would invite legislators up to speak first. But uh, we we're talking all the time. Representative Zara is here. Former Representative Cahill. Uh, Senator Bruce Dow, thank you, Senator, for being here. Uh, Representative Ferrante is somewhere. Representative Ferrante is over here. My good friend, Representative Paul Tucker. Uh, not that the rest of you aren't my good friends. <laughs> Paul Tucker retweets you the most, so that's right. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Paracel is here, too. So, Jerry, thank you for being here. Did I miss any reps or senators? Anyone that want to be a rep or a senator? Barbara <laughs> Oh, and uh, yes, and this, uh, speaking of the Women's Office, is representative as well. Uh, Mayor Halday from uh, uh, New Report is here, thank you. Um, and uh, a host of uh, uh, other local officials, including Matt St. Hilaire of uh, Beverly City Council. So, okay, so we're going to go this way. From Congressman Moulton's office, too. I'm sorry. Congressman Moulton's office is here, thank you. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? <laughs> Seriously, anyone else that I missed? I know that uh, there, are, uh, there are legislative aides that are here as well, um, as well as my own staff. So uh, thanks everyone for being here. Jamie, go right ahead. Uh, if I may, yeah. I didn't know I was sitting next to the mayor. I'd like to allow the mayor to speak before I do. Uh, sure. Um, Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm glad to hear from the mayor. Uh, Newburyport is, you know, obviously the Merrimack River empties into the Atlantic Ocean there, uh, bordered by, we have uh, Newbury, Newburyport and uh, Salisbury. Our river was, was dredged seven years ago, Senator, seven years ago. Um, and it uh, fills in very quickly. It is uh, the third most dangerous river, I think, in the country. That's where we have a Coast Guard station there who are highly skilled and trained. We have, uh, we were very fortunate to advocate with the help of Bruce Tarr and our legislative team to go to Washington to convince the Army Corps there that we needed our jetties repaired because they were contributing to a lot of uh, erosion. I think everybody in this room has at one point or another seen a house falling into the ocean at uh, on Plum Island. So uh, we're so dangerous, uh, dangerous relating to dredging or dangerous relating to dangerous relating to uh, the, just the currents and okay. and Thank the you. tides and navigation <coughs> and the sandbars that build up there. Um, and it's uh, it's it's very dangerous. Okay. And so. Uh, we work, we have an a, a incredibly developed harbor um, master and all of his team who are diligent during the summer, but there's not a week that goes by that we don't have issues there. Yeah. So we're talking safety, but it's also economic development because we do have small fishing uh, vessels that are still uh, operating <coughs> in both Salisbury and Newburyport and uh, a very large recreational boating facility that, uh, our boating community that continues to grow and grow, especially since we just finished a new uh, boating uh, facility, transient boater yeah. facility. Yeah. So um, it's important, and I think we used our last dredge, we put uh, the sand on, the, on both sides of the beaches for the river, which was very helpful in terms of, of that component. Um, we have talked about needing another another dredge at this point, um, but we are very fortunate to have uh, Bruce Tarr, Senator Tarr, lead the Merrimack River Beach Alliance, which we meet with representatives from Salisbury, Newburyport, and Amesbury, um, and Newbury, and we've been meeting uh, for eight, nine years, and are very successful in terms of working with the Army Corps and advancing different initiatives, and certainly dredging is one of the things that is on the table now that we need. Have and you, uh, in, in this collaborative effort, have you talked about buying a dredge, or what you would do if you had your own dredge, as opposed to contract? Uh, we have, but you know, we haven't, it hasn't moved forward in terms of that particular piece. But uh, certainly that's something we could, could look at because the river needs to be dredged more often than, um, I'm sorry about Bass River in 50 years, but we're at seven, eight years and it needs to be done again. So it would be very helpful to have our own dredge in terms of yeah. moving that We're, we're fascinated with the concept of uh, helping communities come together, pool resources, including our own, and uh, be able to acquire their own dredge. Cape is doing it successfully. We might even get a second one down the Cape, it's so successful. So there are yes. times where this will work and there are times where it won't. 
We're not going to require that. We don't see ourselves requiring that. But I think that's the easiest way in terms of continuing maintenance. Exactly. And use, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense to yeah. do that. It's something you could get, I think, private partners to get involved in. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're set up as this organization to begin to move forward on this. And we're very excited about the prospect of being able to have some funding to be able to advance yeah, this sure. initiative for our joint communities. Great. Great. Thank you. Sure. So uh, if I could uh, ask everybody here um, a question that I have had come up that had mixed responses. Um, should the state do the dredging or should uh, you and the uh, municipalities do the dredging? So who thinks the state should be responsible? I mean, if we're paying, for, it's okay if we pay for it, but who thinks the state should be responsible? Nobody. Is there a third Is there option? state slash federal, state slash state slash no, uh, we're hoping to work. Is anyone here from the federal? Uh, we had we had a representative from the Army Corps last time, so uh, uh, we know that uh, there's an opportunity. To, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, but but I'm sorry. Uh, your your representative congressman's office, but not not the Army Corps of Engineers, unless you have multiple. No. Uh, we want to get together with the federal government, and we want to get together with you on the municipal level and coordinate and streamline uh, the way that we do things. Um, but that doesn't happen right now. So when we go out to, uh, uh, what I've heard from some communities is that there's an expectation that the state would go out and contract with somebody to dredge, which I don't want to do, frankly. Um, and I've heard from some communities that we're okay doing it on our own, which I'd rather have you do. Uh, you know, again, as a former city manager, I wanted to, I wanted to be the one that was paving the streets, not waiting for the state to pave the streets for me. So, um, so all right, th there's nobody here that thinks that the state is the solution. And while I'm on this uh, uh, question. Um, no, we'll go, uh, go on. Jamie, go ahead. What was the third option you want to bring up? Uh, I, I will, sure. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jamie Medea. used to be Jamie Buchanan. I, I represent quite a few people in this room. I'm an environmental attorney, uh, but the reason I came today is not an individual client who's here. I represent the Mass Marine Trades Association, which is business of recreational boating. That's the marinas and the boatyards. Um, and the businesses generally. What's the name of the organization again, Jamie? The Massachusetts Marine Trades Association. Trades? Trades, plural, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's not a union or non-union thing. It's a trades as in working the water. Yeah. Um, and I, I will answer your question about um, what I meant by a third option by starting to say, you asked for criteria um, for prioritizing money. And I think one of the biggest criteria should be partnerships on a regional basis that show that there is an overall plan from all the participants who have a stake in the outcome of dredging, and they're all, generally speaking, participating in some way. That would include both environmental organizations that might um, have concerns, as well as those who have potential money to pay for it. So my first point was about prioritization, and what you were asking about was um, state or local, don't leave out the private sector. Um, respectfully, the public sector pays too much for everything that it does. It pays enormously more, and it takes longer to do everything. The place that, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think some of us would agree with you, and some of us would think that we've done some okay things as well. Absolutely, yeah. fantastically. What I meant was the, the requirements of law yeah. are different for the private sector than they are for the public sector. Okay. Sometimes that's good, but in the context of um, a lot of projects where you have the opportunity to have private sector do portions of it, they can often work faster more cheaply and get their portion done. Okay. So prioritize on the basis of partnerships and consider where it can be done on a, on a basis of you've incentivized someone to do it in the private sector because the permitting has been taken care of by the public sector. Another fundamental point is who owns those tidelands that need to be dredged? Usually the Commonwealth owns them. Sometimes there's federal interest, which is why they will pay for some of the dredging for the yeah. significant commercial channels, yeah. but the public sector owns the tidelands usually. And therefore, I think they should be paying for the testing of the tidelands. It's $100,000 to meet the Army Corps' requirements for potential disposal at sea. Who's the they in this case? Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. No, uh, they should be paying. Who is the they in this case? I am suggesting the way to prioritize funding for dredging projects is for the public sector, us, the, the Commonwealth, to fund testing 
protocols, te fund testing projects okay. on a regional basis okay. so that everyone knows what they're dealing with yeah, on I'm, Commonwealth I'm not owned. There, just so you know, and if you want to oh, get interesting. I'm not there. The reason why I'm not there is that um, I need local cooperation yep. to get things done. And if I'm yep. going to um, spend my limited dollars on mm -hmm. um, as much dredging as I can, if I'm spending it on testing, yep. I'm concerned that it's not going to get done on a local level. What I'd rather do as part of the application process is to see that part of the contribution from the municipality was to do the testing in the permit. That they've already done it. But you see, that that's the problem. If they've already done it, but I haven't done it either. Somebody has to do yeah. it. Yeah. So I know. Correct. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure to go around to uh, every community. Yeah. Uh, we don't have, uh, but you all know your community, your power masters, your uh, agencies that are set up. You all know your communities. You know uh, better than we will know uh, what the local um, um, uh, nuances are about a program. So just as is the case with um, with highway money, where the state doesn't come in or the federal government doesn't come in and pay for the design work, that's the expectation on the local level, or the right of way takings, that's the expectation on the local level, and then you present it, and then the state or the federal government comes and pays it, we're thinking about the same model as well, um, whether it's the testing public portion or the municipal portion. But credit is always whatever match we would be requiring. I hear you're far along on this. I ask you to no, just, not. This is just thinking that. You're, I think you're far along. It sounds far along on the you're not there yet. In fact, you're already on the other page. Consider the cost of testing as prohibitive for the marinas and the boatyards that are on the Commonwealth tidelands. They don't own those tidelands. So they've been maintaining them. Okay. And they can't maintain them because the state and the feds have set the, the standard of what the testing's supposed to be so high that it's $100,000 just to test their little marina or boatyard that is uh, in their tidelands that is owned by the Commonwealth. Yeah, okay, I hear you. I don't think we're gonna get there, but I hear you. It, it's, it's sure an idea. The other, I would say, is, is very important is besides the fact that Commonwealth owns them, the geographic partnerships will get at the economic benefits and the sheer recreational benefits of the recreational boating. People tend towards the commercial boating, which is very, very important for fishing, for commerce. They tend to be able to quantify those interests more easily because they have better relationships on a long-term basis. With the marinas and the boatyards, surprisingly, it, it's not well quantified yet. There are 195,000 registered boats, registered only, not even including federally documented. And registered, vessels. Registered, registered vessels. recreational, recreational vessel. not commercial, just recreational. Registered recreational vessels, and that doesn't even include federally documented, which is probably another 15% more, I'm guessing. I'm talking statewide. And pretty much most of the senators, the reps, everybody here, they're in the boating caucus, which is a legislative boating caucus. You have me, you have other people, and we can get that data on a regional basis to help document why the main channels plus the tributaries, because if you don't do the tributaries at the same time as the channels, you're just silting up the channels again. So quantify all the economics with regional partnerships for the testing and for the economic impacts of what happens if you lose the docks, the slips, the moorings that have attracted so many people and keeping those property values high. Yeah. That's one of the, the, almost the last observation. And the final one was safety. Um, absolutely safety. unquestionable. Safety has to be first. To be first yeah. So in application for grants, I really hope what you do, and loans, uh, low-cost loans are really good. Really, really, really good. Long-term paybacks of low-cost loans is way better than no money at all. Mass development can do it. All kinds of people can do it. I mean, agencies that are already set up and authorities. Uh, and of course, we could always create one legislatively. No, that's so, interesting. We hadn't thought about loans, but uh, absolutely, low-cost loans are so worth it with a long payback. Put those conditions in. You were talking about um, no free lunch. What I don't know what you called it. But you said no free lunch. <laughs> no, you, you basically said it's not a free handout. There's a you know this uh, participation. It's a partnership. Yeah. What we need is a partnership. Yeah, I'm, I am too. I'm, I'm, my class is too blessed to complain. Uh, so, get put the conditions in the loans. Make them long term and do them so people can afford with partnerships to do their part. They can't without that. Sure. And make them safety first, then the economic benefits for everybody, um, then the regional partnerships get the most credit, especially if they've included the environmental organizations because the appeals for something are, are just huge. And then the final one, and I'll step down, um, is the disposal locations. You can't expect the private sector to figure out disposal locations um, or reuse locations. That has to come from the public sector, especially the state because there are no more disposal locations in the works right now, and we need them.
uh, including CAD cells. You can do local CAD cells with participation in advance. People will sign up for where to put their dredge material to create a CAD cell. They'll pay as they go. Sure. And may I answer any questions for you? No. Well, we had a conversation, so that's great. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else in this uh, room? Anyone else in this room? Anyone else in this room? Go right ahead. Take your Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Lisa O'Donnell. I am the chair of the Board of Selectmen in Essex, which is one of the smallest communities on the North Shore. Uh, we have a population of about 3,600 um, 3, people. Uh, we have the Essex River, which flows from downtown down to the um, mouth of the Essex River. We have two issues with uh, where we need dredging. One is at the outside where there's a lot of sand buildup. Um, the other is the inside area right downtown Essex where there's a lot of silt buildup. So we're faced with two different problems. We're also faced with a very small population. Um, we have 10% commercial base. We don't have a commercial tax rate. So bottom line, dredging is not something that Essex can see conceivably afford. Uh, to that end, we've started looking at creative ways to try and piggyback coastal resiliency issues on um, our dredging effort. So at the mouth of the river, we have a lot of sand that could be beneficially reused at other places that need nourish nourishment for the beaches. And um, we're also looking, we've been working with the Army Corps of Engineers already. We've actually, um, uh, Representative Moulton's first uh, legislative action was a bill that uh, realigned the federal channel through the Essex River. So we've become eligible for federal funding that way. Uh, <clears throat> that was. Can you do the rest of the North Shore? <laughs> so we removed the encroachments from the Federal Channel and actually the Army Corps has already been working in the Essex River doing sampling and surveying, um, putting us hopefully in a position to receive some sort of federal funding for that work. In the meantime, we've also been working with the National Wildlife Federation and some other local environmental groups uh, looking at uh, coastal resiliency issues and green infrastructure and trying to make our coastline more resilient uh, against climate change and sea level rise. Uh, what we're looking at mainly is is trying to use reuse the silt to restore marshes to build up the area. So we're hoping that that approach um, produces. Uh, we're just starting with the Army Corps right now, and, and that's the road we're going down. And that's why they're doing some of the sampling, and they're looking at it, and we're working with them with that. So we don't know where it's going yet, but we see that that uh, sort of a synergistic approach between using uh, coastal re resiliency uh, as a way to dispose of dredge spoils. So we're focusing more on the fact that we're trying to build up the marshes and to offer sand for beach nourishment rather than dredging. So it's a way to hopefully get a win-win out of it because our, our river hasn't been dredged in 30 years. And it is a public safety concern. Our harbor master is right here and he'll reiterate that. Uh, harbor master can't get out at low tide. The Coast Guard can't get in at low tide. So we have a, a long stretch of river that's virtually inaccessible for an emergency situation at low tide. So there's a public safety concern. Uh, the Essex River is mostly um, recreational boating and we also have a large shell fishing, a commercial shell fishing um, group. When that you think about dredging, will you open up uh, new shell fishing beds? We we're looking at that. We're looking at opening up new shellfish beds, restoring eelgrass beds. Um, so there's the, that's part of what the Army Corps is. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think that the the combination of doing um, something the beneficial reuse of the dredge spoils is really important. Just dumping them out at sea is is a waste of money and spoils that could be used somewhere else. The, the silt that falls into the marsh a lot of times comes from the marsh and if we're able to use the thin layer deposition methods and rebuild the marsh it will help make them more resilient. Um, as sea level rises we're just going to lose marsh. We don't have enough upland for it to migrate so building it up is going to be important for us. So that's our story. I'm happy to provide a whole lot more but yeah, yeah. I want to keep it short. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to have one person from each community but if you want to do you have anything quickly you want to add? Uh, just very quick. Yeah. Well, uh, he's going up. Um, been happy with it. I'm going to come to your part after this part. I'm from Essex. Okay. Okay. But I'm opposed to the dredging. I think it would be useful if I could speak. Okay, great. Um, people who have found the federal permitting process satisfactory, I'll encourage you. Again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's not one of my jokes. <laughs> people who feel the other way? I found it. Okay, so I would like somebody who's going to be coming up to the microphone to talk more about that.
people who've been satisfied or above with the state permitting process. Even less people. Uh, people who, oh no, okay. No, no, thank you though for that offer. People who have been frustrated by the state permitting process, raise your hand. Okay, so we have work to do. Yeah. Jay, I appreciate the opportunity here. Thank you. I'm just going to, I don't want to take too much time and pass it to our other brothers and sisters here that have other concerns like I do, but I just wanted to add to, as Lisa said, we, as she indicated, we have so many miles of, of waterfront, and it's not just the access for the water. We have all sorts of uh, creeks and tributaries that, that feed into this. And as, as early as last week, we had a search and rescue of an overdue boat that was on, on the news and so forth. But the, the, the dredging is a public safety issue. And I'm here to say, I think that, I don't know if anybody's really gonna dispute that here, we're all trying to do the same thing and provide the best level of service that we can. But I have to tell you, in Essex, this is, if this were an artery, and maybe that's the best way that I can equate this, you, you wouldn't ignore it. You know, eventually something uh, not well is going to happen. Yeah, exactly. and, and that's what's happening down here. It's been a long time since the dredging has happened, as Lisa indicated. But at times, this is a public safety, really serious emergency concern. And that's what we're trying to uh, address. So I just want to make a, a major appeal to all of the legislators that are here before us today. We count on you. We depend on you so much. We need the help down there, and we're no different than many of the other communities. But uh, I can tell you that the, you know this, there's so many people that are depending on on, uh, on on our river. Those that have boated the Essex River, those that are familiar with it, you will you have some idea of what I'm speaking of. But we're really counting on you because in the absence of doing something about this, it is going to get worse. It is not going to get better. And and when I cannot get the the harbor master boat off of the dock. That's terrible. I mean, we can't say, well, you know, I've had somebody say, well, why don't you put the boat out to Canomo Point? Terrific. We'll put the boat out to Canomo Point and we'll have, a, have an emergency inside. So there's give and take in all, but I appreciate it. I think you get the gist of it. But again, please appeal. Uh, I'm appealing to all the legislators. E Essex is really hurting on this and we really need some remediation in short order if we can. And I think that we, Essex is definitely, um, as Lisa indicated, really taking a different approach to what we're doing with the dredging spoils. And I think that that's really key in this whole thing because I think we're all uh, environmentally conscious and the, the process that we're taking certainly deserves some uh, yeah, second like set of eyes. We were really doing the dredging material and, yeah. and what we uh, need to do from an environmental standpoint about how we can help out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I'm the only person here who came to oppose a dredging project. If so, I apologize for your time. Um, my concerns are uh, uh, reflected by a number of people who are working to protect the Essex River and who happen to be the people who have the longest history of putting big vessels into the river. So I'm just going to interrupt for one second. I want to be clear about what we're doing here today. We're not talking about whether we're going to dredge Essex. Uh, right. right. I just want to tell you the problems. And if you're setting priorities, I think it's important to understand why many people in Essex would not only consider this a low priority, but are dead set against it. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you on that again. Good. I'm not here to, to referee the Essex. I'm here to develop a program around dredging. Right. So if you want to give me something quick, I'll, I'll be I do. to hear it. Okay. The, the issue is, in setting priorities, ought to be need. Okay. And we feel strongly there is no need for this, that the, the biggest public safety issue that's reiterated over and over again is the Harbor Master's boat. And the okay. thought- That's Essex specific need. I'm not refereeing the Essex- Okay. Right so in this case- I agree that if I set up a statewide program, public safety should be part of that. Yes, but we have no public safety issue. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I'm trying to set the statewide- The boat, the boat can be moved. Okay. The other issue is people, the people who bring big vessels up and down that river, Harold Burnham's shipyard and my family's shipyard, which built the big Gloucester fishing schooners, the Gertrude T. Bow, the Columbia, all of those big schooners went in the water at that basin where the harbor master is complaining he doesn't have any water at low tide. Okay? And they didn't dredge in those days. It was way before there was... They the, well, they dredged not, in a completely yeah, not, different way. Yes. Okay. I'm trying to establish a statewide program. Okay, people bring... I should be looking at it for statewide The other issue is dredge spoils on the marsh, we believe is, is a, just every example of it that we've seen in the history of Essex has been a disaster. There are still big mud areas where dredge spoils were dumped in the 50s and 60s. They, they are happen to be right near my house and I walk across them. They have still not recovered. Got it. Go ahead. Um, there are a number of issues about recognizing, I, I think when people say economic value, 
There's even been a claim from, from our Board of Selectmen that this is going to create jobs. People need to look at those things very carefully. We're talking about three tiny marinas with may get a few more slips. There is no evidence of jobs. And it's very easy to throw those words out and public safety and to get say, people say, especially the legislators, they say, oh, God, we got to get behind this. Well, you ought to look carefully because there are a lot of people who might pick apart those rationales. Finally, we're not against dredging. Gloucester has dredging. There are any of the big rivers. The Merrimack desperately needs to keep up with its dredging. I worked in, in Newburyport for the Maritime Museum there. It's absolutely true, and they need to do it frequently. But Essex is a little tiny tidal river, a tidal river surrounded by the biggest salt marsh in Massachusetts. Okay. And those are very different environments. And I would hope that legislators can, can sort out the difference between where there's a real need and a real potential for, for doing something, but a river that's going to silt in immediately again okay. and has no industry. That's why we're asking for maintenance plan afterwards. Yeah, but there's no, there's no industry there. Okay. All the people who want to use the river <coughs> use it. They just watch the tide. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. If you're happy with how the dredging is going, thank the legislators. If you're unhappy, talk to me about it. So, uh, <laughs> legislators are doing the right thing. Um, well, we're on this lane. Andy, you're all set? Yeah. Quick, quick talk again. You want to talk? Uh, Can you stay up? Right. Anyone else in this row want to be? All set? This row, coming back this way? Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. As he's coming, I want to thank everyone for your time and uh, your patience. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to stay longer. So, uh, Mayor, what time was uh, Matt? What time did we have to get out of here? Six thirty is another. Six thirty is another. Okay. Go ahead. Right. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Secretary, for taking the time to hear everybody out on either side of this. Who I have here with me, my name is Tom Schmitton, I'm the Gloucester Harbor Master. This is Tony Gross, who's the, ch uh, the uh, chairman of the Gloucester Waterways Board. Um, I think everyone wants to achieve the exact same goal, so I'll just, I'd like to advocate for dredging and how it affects our community, how it affects the economic base to our community, and how we've spent a lot of money already on uh, development and infrastructure on the waterfront. So. Um, Gloucester, I'm as I'm listening, if I don't tweet it, it didn't really happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, as you know, Gloucester is the oldest seaport in the country, and our infrastructure is very, very old. The oldest. The oldest. The oldest. Huh? So, um, Andy, is that true? This is <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Gloucester is the oldest seaport. It's dubbed the oldest. Say it with passion, I'll believe it. It is. So, our infrastructure on this, on the, you know, oceanfront infrastructure is very, very old. Yeah. Um, we have a unique situation where most communities aren't. We're an island. We're separated by a federal channel called the Anasquam River. The Anasquam River houses a couple uh, marinas and is the beginning leg of the intercoastal waterway. It is a federal channel that is maintained uh, by, uh, navigationally by the U.S. Coast Guard. The U.S. Coast Guard aids navigations currently at low tide lean over. They are not floating anymore. Wow. They are aground. When was the last time it was uh, good? 1963. So this is, a big, this is a big problem. We also have tributaries, many homeowners, many recreational boaters. Last year alone, 19,000 recreational boats and commercial boats transited the Anasquam River. Numerous thousands other transited the Blimmon Canal that didn't require a bridge opening. Just to put this in perspective, the Anasquam River holds a cut bridge called the Blimmon Bridge Canal. It's the second busiest bridge on the East Coast. We are dying for, to get it dredged. Uh, at low tide, in certain parts of the river, we have less than two feet of water. This is, I will argue that, and I will tell you, being an 11-year U.S. Coast Guard veteran, that this is an absolute public safety issue. Um, to travel, the Coast Guard is no longer allowed to bring the 47-foot motor lifeboat through the Anasquam River. That's a 17-mile journey around Cape Ann to respond to search and rescue in Essex Bay. That's a problem. In February, you don't have two hours to respond to search and rescue for a commercial vessel going down or calling or hailing a mayday. This is a big, big problem that we're running into. Not only that, it's the economic development portion. All these boats, 
coming into the city using the water sheet, using the marinas, local, you know, businesses depend on this waterway. Uh, people that travel, the, uh, the tourism portion of it is huge. People use this waterway. Not to mention the commercial aspect of the fishing grounds and the closures and so on and so forth that are in our area or outside of our area that commercial fishermen depend on using this waterway to travel north to good fishery grounds that are open and not restricted for the federal government. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Tony Gross here and he can speak on what, you know, more institutional knowledge and history of what Gloucester's done so far because I'm relatively new to the scene. So thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, Tony, I'd be uh, interested in hearing uh, why since 1963. Um, very, very, uh, very good presentation. Lots of reasons why it should be good. Why hasn't it? Well, probably because the, the job that was done in 63 probably lasted 20 years. Okay, be the so first reason. So we're up to 83. Now, now, now T, T, <laughs> TJ um, did miss one point, and like you said, institutional knowledge. The state did in partnership, and I'm not sure what the economic partnership uh, ratio was because I wasn't on the waterways board at the time. They dredged the mouth, just the mouth. It was a very small scale job, um, and that didn't last all that long. That was about six, eight years ago. So that has happened, but it really was just a minor band-aid so the boats could just even get in the river. Yeah. Now, we, um, we like Essex, had, uh, it was a previous congressman, Tierney, um, redesignated an area within our, um, within the Anasquam River area, a large anchorage area, mooring area, um, called Lobster Cove, redesignated that to draw the, the boundaries in um, within so that all the docks, the private docks, were outside of the federal project area, which then made that eligible. Since the, uh, the WERDA Act, the Water Resource Reform um, Development Act, Water Resources Reform and Development Act, since that now um, authorizes the Army Corps to consider recreational um, in their mission of dredging, uh, that this, that um, re, uh, Within that reauthorization act was when this um, redesignation was created for uh, for us to allow the dredging within that cove, but also we've we've pushed the uh, that recreational piece because uh, as you know the fishing industry has been in decline although we still have um, when the tides are high the day boats that uh, fish in Ipswich Bay for whiting and bait fish do use it when the tides are high. So there is a, a, and the lobster boats come up into Ipswich Bay also through the river out of downtown. And there is a considerable amount of daily traffic um, used by commercial vessels, which was the major criteria, um, was commerce for the Army Corps. Now, when you asked, is, have you been um, happy with the Army Corps or the federal permitting, I raised my hand because the Army Corps has done a lot of our, uh, did the permitting and paid for, did the testing, sampling and testing. Yeah. They are now in the process of the environmental assessment um, for this. Um, but we're, but it's just so slow that we need, um, I don't think the Army Corps is going to do this on their own without some help. Right there. That's why I don't want to do it. Because if you wait for me to do everyone's testing, there's going to be many Tonys that are going to get up there and say, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Right, but the problem... But the feds but, don't test everybody. They yeah. only test the federal navigation channel. They don't test the tributaries. I know, oh, no, I understand that, but the, federal, but the federal's responsibility, what they do test, it's taking time to test. Well, that was really relatively quick. Yeah, to relatively get to that point yeah. was years. And, and in fact, on the to-do list for the, uh, the agent in charge, he has all the things, and then the very last line is retire. But, um, <laughs> but, but, it, but, but we are, we're in the, we're in the queue and it's in, because of the safety issue, which I cannot I emphasize um, enough that I'm a commercial fisherman, I fish on that side and it can be quite, it's not as bad as going into Newburyport, but it can get pretty bad. Nothing's bad going into Newburyport. <laughs> it can, on, on, an, on an easterly swell, it can be pretty bad coming into that river. So we I don't know if I should take that as a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> but I but I but I do have I, I do have to say that I think that if I know in Gloucester, um, I'm also on the school committee. 
and I know that we have to make hard decisions every budget season. Yeah. And if we're relying on us to have to carry a heavy load of this, yeah. we're going to decide to keep police on the streets, firemen in the yeah. firehouses, school teachers in the classrooms yeah. over dredging the river. So I can't emphasize enough that, that in some communities the capacity is not there to be able to carry a big bird. Now we've benefited greatly from the Seaport Economic Council. They've invested a considerable amount of money on our, on our um, our working waterfront on our boulevard, um, the seawall, the, the opening to the bridge um, has all been rebuilt. That's a, in partnership. I mean, you know, when, it, when the 25 percent is, 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 you know, doable. But I think anything over that, we probably would not. We're also, we're. we're it's, gonna, it's, it's likely that it'll be open. So but we are, we are. If you think about, uh, interrupt for a second if I could, if you think about the universe of judging we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, partnership uh, means uh, you know, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yep. In order for us to be able to get to every one of you, everybody on the South Shore as well. By the way, South Shore had uh, twice as many twice as many people turn out, so there's a lot, lots of communities yep. that are interested. Uh, 70, what, how many? Anyone? So, a lot of front communities, well, oh. coastal communities, 78 communities. We're probably, uh, to be candid with everybody, we're probably looking at a 50 50. And, and, and we, as, as, our, as the economic. Um, uh, wave is changing um, in Gloucester. We have um, increased our our visiting boater presence uh, significantly with the new harbor master. He's, he's created a lot of online presence and online reservations, but also we have built a um, through with big boating infrastructure grant, Seaport uh, Seaport Advisory Council money that we had from before. Our own significant, probably 35, 40 percent and National Grid project, it was on a National Grid piece of property, they were doing a, um, a remediation. They, they, we built a, a, a dock facility that's worth well over a million dollars um, with, with, with all those partnerships. And like I said, the city probably contributed about 35% of the, uh, the revenues for that. Yeah, now, you know, so uh, Tony, I'm gonna ask you to finish up if I could. Yep. Uh, as you're thinking about how you wanna close. So I'm a former municipal manager. I appreciate everything you can say about balancing police and fire and in schools and uh, senior centers and streets, but this is another asset of the community. So right, absolutely. We have to, we have to oh, I, uh, now for the communities that are saying, oh my God, I'm, I'm, unfortunately Gloucester's not in this place, but there are communities that figuratively but literally don't have the money to do anything, do anything. Um, you know, there'll be hardship opportunities to talk about, but that has to be the exception of the rule. Right. We all have to look at each other as adults and say, listen, if we're gonna make commitments to each other going forward, this is what you're gonna expect from the state, this is what the state's gonna expect from you. And um, we'll continue to do that year after year after year. I, I guess my, the, my, my closing question would be is, uh, we're already in the queue on the, on the Army Corps. Is there a way for your economic housing and economic development office to help push that forward and partner either through legislative act or uh, legislative pressure or or even you know a partnership with the state the city and the federal government okay we don't like to call it legislative pressure we like to call it cooperation <laughs> 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 uh, we are intrigued uh, so the army corps has uh, initially reached out to us and want to have a conversation we are intrigued by the idea of mm -hmm. being able to uh, work collaboratively with the army corps now i don't know if it's going to work out or not uh, to gain efficiencies economies of scale and the like the uh, convenience of permitting and the like and uh, it may be that a priority uh, in a priority category would be something that you know we have the army corps ready to go type thing right. we do that now so i have i have two big programs that i run one is for uh, affordable housing the other is for infrastructure called MassWorks. Many of you in the municipal side, you know what MassWorks is. Oftentimes, the affordable housing project requires a new street, which is my MassWorks grant. We have to make sure they're aligned. We have a history of making sure that things are aligned like that. Um, so we'd like to be able to think that we can do that. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, yep. Thanks, um, I'm, I'm uh, since Ron Foster and Ann Slumber, can I say something or you just did. Turn? Okay, go ahead. I don't know if I should have covered this or not. Who's next? Oh, I, I, just, I just want to support, I, I don't know how many other folks from Anasquam are here, but I just want to support what was said. My name is Jock, Jock Burneff, and I'm the, the Vice Commodore of the Anasquam Yacht Club. The mission of that club is boating. I was uh, probably 12 years old uh, when that river was dredged, and I, and I remember it. I just want to, yeah, yeah. just a couple years ago. Yeah, I was, no, I was a kid. I'm a kid now, and I was a kid then. But, but I, w I just want to speak to the, just the safety aspects and also the commercial aspects of Lobster Cove 
uh, and the river. That river. I you do me a favor. I want to make sure I'm getting something new out of you, and we're pressuring you on this. I understand the safety piece. I thought the ASIC people did a nice job on it. Others did. If there's something unique about the safety piece, let me hear about it. But I understand the safety piece. Well, it's, it's only the safety piece from the standpoint of the young kids that are at the Yacht Club day in and day out with the river narrowing, the, the velocity of the current probably being twice what it, what it is, um, and, and also just the whole mooring field um, in Lobster Cove being a fraction of what it was before, thus revenue. Right, and so I, ju I just want to support what was said uh, as, as maybe one of the only stakeholders along the river. I don't know if there's other stakeholders as opposed to public officials, I but I'm passionate about this. I, I fully understand and appreciate the safety piece, and that's going to be a major priority for us. So thanks for sharing that. All right. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm Chief Paul Nickus from Ipswich. I'm also the Harbor Master. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll be really brief. Ipswich, the Ipswich River was last dredged. To the best of our recollection, in 1907, and in Ipswich, and it is a federal channel, actually. Now, a historic preserve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what's a little unique about Ipswich is we have really no economic development anywhere along our river or um, on a right. Um, I have 43 miles of coast, 900 acres of clam flats, if not more. Um, Ipswich lands 25% of the entire soft shell clam industry in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but to the point, we have um, the public safety issues for us is, and along with Essex, Coast Guard uh, Gloucester will not come into Ipswich Bay any longer beyond the mouth of the Essex River, yeah. which they have told us it is too dangerous. If it's not high, half tide or above, we will not come. So everything falls to us for emergency response. I have Crane Beach. I have 1,100 moorings on any weekend. Half the boat is here, probably show up in Ipswich Sound, Plum Island Sound, close to 5,000 boats. Our sandbar in front of Crane Beach is about half the size of Ipswich at this point. And the idea of taking our sand and protecting Plum Island and parts of the Great Marsh, I think, is probably the way to go. And I would love to see Ipswich, Essex, and Gloucester and the Anderscorm get one big dredge to take all three rivers and clean them out. So I encourage you to do that. The other thing, the other question, anyone jump in? Have you, so has there been any discussion about uh, mining, sand, and sound? Yes. And we don't allow that currently, but. There are several proposals on the table. The Army Corps of Engineers has identified uh, the region around, uh, basically from around the New Hampshire border, yeah. 3 million cubic yards of sand that could be mined without damaging the environment oh. to place them. So it's something that we heard down in uh, the South Show that uh, it's a way of raising revenues. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, Tony? Yeah, yeah the, so the Tony's point is too light, though, in the Anaswam. Well, you're going to be a better salesman then, that's all. <laughs> 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 that's not my assessment, that's what was told me. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for us, the economic impact is all recreational for the most part, except that, you know when the clamors go out at low tide, my boats can't get to them. Yeah. Um, we actually currently use a private dock to keep our do um, uh, emergency response vessel out there just for that purpose because the rescue that Chief Civil was referring to, we could not launch. We attempted to launch and both my fire boat and police boat got stuck in my own I river. I encourage you guys to continue to talk. I encourage you to think about this uh, idea of uh, a joint purchase of a dredge and what it might mean. It's, um, you know, we're, we're in this for the medium to long haul. We want to get this right. You know, the governor continues to um, press us all to come up with plans and then be able to implement those plans. So we'd love to think about this. And it may not be that I can buy everybody a dredge tomorrow, but if I understand that the dredge will be able to do this, that, or the other thing, and it's it ultimately <coughs> is a good thing, we would be uh, willing to entertain this. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, and then I'm going to use pictures, so it'll reduce the number of words. And I'll hold this job. Awesome. I'm Joel Higginson, I'm chairman of the Dredge Committee at Farmers Cove Yacht Club. Mike Sanderson is a member of my committee, and Mike McMahon. I'm sorry, Farmers Cove? Farmers Cove in Salem. Salem. Yeah. Um, these are basically pictures of uh, Point Sonoma Marina. This is what we're talking about, basically. Uh, marina was constructed 1985 to 1987. By 2005, it was mostly abandoned. It's almost all filled in in 2012, and it's completely wow. dead today. That's, wow. No money. I've attended 
several listening sessions on the West Coast yeah. because I did all the permitting for a shipyard that reactivated two of the dry docks at Mayor Allen. On the West Coast, part of what's happened is the Army Corps' resources and budgets have been decimated. So they don't have their own significant dredging resources any longer. So everything has had to become privatized for the most part. We dredged last time in 1981, and it was mostly paid for by state funds. When was that, 1981? 1981, okay. Yeah, about 36 years ago. So now we realize that you know, we're in a situation we've silted up to where we were in 1981. So now we've got a situation where we're in the same, con same condition now that we were in when we had the dredge last time. I'll be yeah. happy to send those to you as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so this, so meaning dead, meaning like what, these, what this marina is not, no longer in use? This little, n no longer, totally abandoned. This uh, little half here was made by privately owned. Privately owned, yeah. Privately yeah. Owned, yeah. And yeah. all of these slips were uh, gone. What's that? Point Sonoma. Point Sonoma. Yeah. Oh, okay. This this little okay. path here was made by uh, Thank you. a friend of mine as an airboat. So. Oh, really? Okay. Well, that's interesting. This is what we look like now. We've got at low tide, we've got boats sitting on the mud. The entrance to our channel, this happened to be a Gloucester boat for the Gloucester folks, racing boat mischief. To get that boat into our channel, they had to put the entire crew out on a boom and lift it, and then we ran a line out to them to pull them in. It's good name for both of them, Mr. Okay. We're looking at a total budget for Oops, sorry. 25,000 yards is 1.2 million. Uh, permitting, our analysis costs were close to 100,000. Total permitting is 156,000. And basically, we contribute about $840,000 a year to the local economy. And then our members, through dining and restaurants and such, we, uh, we figure contribute another 840,000. So we're talking about a you know, 1.6 to $1.7 million contribution to the local economy. Yep. Uh, we, our permitting process is long. We are self-funding it right now through assessments. We've assessed members for two and a half years. Going forward, we're gonna go for another few years, but we've lost 30 members out of our 350 total um, because okay. they don't wanna pay the assessment. Yeah. Okay. We're trying to do it privately. We've invited, we had meetings with seven contractors yeah. to talk about our project. We hope to dredge next fall. And one of the keys is mobilization costs. It's trying to, and I think Manchester will probably speak to this as well. You gotta try to get projects linked together so that when these dredgers bring their equipment in, it makes sense to do multiple yeah, projects together. So, and, and that's a big deal. Anything you guys can do to facilitate yeah. that would be helpful. Okay. Mike? The only Mike? thing I have to add is we're, we're, our basin is a state channel, so we're dredging state <coughs> land. Yeah. Again, to keep it operational, we have cycles. It was done in the 20s, it was done in the 50s, done in the 80s, and here we are again. Yeah. <coughs> Just natural progression and how it works. The other option was to give everybody uh, two Homer buckets and insist that they take money. <laughs> but the fisheries people that don't like that. No, they don't care yeah. for that. And uh, the, everybody buying the sailboat is power boaters, so they don't need as much water. <clears throat> From Palmer's Cove also. But in general perspective, I know what you're getting at <coughs> in several suggestions. One, you've heard linkage just now, which you haven't heard before, although I believe there was a talk about regionalization. Uh, linkage essentially is two things. Number one, when you're hearing from various uh, entities, municipalities, whatever, keep that in mind. That's probably the first step in terms of being economically efficient in doing the dredging in the future. Two reasons. Number one, you can regionalize and perhaps standardize some of the testing that's going to be done mm -hmm. just for the nature of the environment. Secondly, the mobilization cost is huge. The mobilization cost, if you're familiar with yeah. it already, I don't want to talk. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, secondly, another criteria in looking at all of the projects may be what do you already have in existence that are going to be 
simply maintenance dredging instead of new dredging. Good. Good. Thank you very oh. much. All right, thanks. Thanks, guys. That's very interesting. All right, we're going to get on this row. And then I'm going to do people that are standing because people that have been standing are, are very, um, are very appreciative. Do you have something immediate? Because I'm going this row. Right. This row. Representative. Just real quick, thank you. I was actually going to introduce myself as Paul Tucker, the state rep from the oldest seat for Salem, but I've been corrected. <laughs> 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 I got say it. Oh, so oh, I was oh, waiting oh, <laughs> Just like the I used to I really yeah, 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 yeah. I Googled it. The first thing it said was before Salem. There was Gloucester. So, <laughs> so, my good friend Bruce Power over there in the other I, 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 I'll be happy to be second to you. So thank you. Um, I actually, uh, PTYC guys are great. We've done a lot of work with them. My question is this that I think should pertain to everybody. What do you envision as the, uh, the timetable logistics of vetting the application and how soon can the money be accessed and, and what's the vetting process? Uh, so we're uh, in August now, hope to be to the governor with some uh, initial uh, recommendations in September, then we'll engage them to the legislature in this September, and uh, maybe uh, by October, November, put out an application. Um, one of the things, though, that we're thinking about is that we understand about the window of revenue. So um, we want to try to align that. Um, I'll be candid with everybody. We've already started the discussion with Manchester, and we may get to Manchester before we get to everybody else. Uh, um, or we may not, so we're going to keep you hanging. <laughs> um, so uh, um, we would hope to be able to get as much money out the door as we can before January, but we don't know. It's like if somebody had the thing bid already, but couldn't figure out how to pay for it, that might accelerate, even though they might not meet the safety issue or the other issue, because we do have some money initiated to do something. Okay. Great. Anyone else in this row? Anyone else in this row? Standing up. Starting over this way, we're going to work. Sorry, we already missed the row, but we'll come back to you. I'm going to give people who are standing. I appreciate uh, you, the, all those of you who are standing. Good afternoon. Greg St. Louis. I'm the city engineer here in Beverly, and I'm also the CONCOM chair in Salem. Uh, I guess I have two questions that are related to funding and efficiencies. Uh, do you view dredging as its own mitigation or requiring mitigation to proceed? I don't know what that question means. So a lot of our dredging project in Beverly is contingent on us performing mitigation activities in nearby salt marshes or other upland locations that are not directly related to our dredging. Do any thoughts about that, Bruce? Uh, I don't know enough about uh, that that's mitigation for uh, yeah, in general, it's the Bass River. Where it's improvement or maintenance? Trying to remove Phragmites from a salt marsh. Uh, uh, the answer is, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, so thank you for raising it. Yep. Just be aware, there are other costs associated with that that aren't directly related to the dredging. Okay. And then uh, my second question is, you referred to dredging and maintenance dredging uh, similar to roadway maintenance in arterial ways. Um, I would suggest that every dredging project I've seen had a historic dredging aperture that was much wider in 1850, 1890 than it was in 1940. Yep. And if, you told, if I told you today I was going to take a four-lane highway and make it a two-lane highway, that would be a problem. Um, yeah, but, but we also know that we don't have enough money right now to do everything <clears throat> we need to do. So in the perfect world, we'd be able to get everything over right. four lanes. I referred it to that way, but I wasn't saying it was that. Sure, right? sure, so, absolutely. Uh, I guess my. <laughs> I want to talk about the Maritime Highway. Uh, I guess my question or, or my comment would be I see a lot of projects, both public and private, restricted to the newer historic limit as opposed to the older historic yeah. limit. And there may be some benefits, benefits and efficiencies and cost savings if you, can benef if you can dredge a little bit wider than the last historic while staying within the older historic limits. So I would, um, I'm, I don't think that that would be a, uh, a plus or a minus in the application process. It would really be we're responding to what the community wants to do. Right. At the end of the day, it's going to be the community wants to do this project, um, and this is what it's going to cost, and this is what we're asking for from the state chair, and we would be able to judge that. Sure. And we might come back and say, which we do on, now going back to the roadway analogy, what we do on some of our master experiences, I will call up a mayor or I will call up a rep and say, I know you wanted $2 million, but I'm going to give you a million and a half, what are you going to do with it? 
and if they can do something with it, then they do it. So it may be that you want to do the four lanes and the water, but they can only take the two with you, and then you have a decision. I guess part of that is sometimes the Army Corps restricts you or you're otherwise restricted to a specific alignment that may not be okay. long-term beneficial. Okay. Thank good, you. Uh, good stuff. Thank you. That's a good example of new information, so you get a star. <laughs> Standing up. Standing up. Yep. This is in reference to Bass River. The citizens have been doing a great job of getting together and talking about it for over decades. Okay, thank you. And uh, one of the issues that was there is where National Grid's property is. Yeah. Some of the property in the river is basically, they're saying it's contaminated. They've had to cap a portion of their property. Yeah. So now how can the state get money out of them for mit actual mitigation in that area first? Because that must be completed first before you do any other dredging. What is National Grid's responsibility right there? Okay. So I got you. I'm on the same page with you. Same page? Okay. And Bass River, reading the books years ago, it was called Bass River because of the abundance of bass that was in there. It wasn't the shoes? Nope. <laughs> it wasn't the shoes. It was, satur it was saturated oh. with bass. <laughs> I digress a bit. The parcel land that I was talking about in Chelsea, this was um, on uh, Beach, Beach Street. Yeah, Beach Street. The parcel land that I got $4 million from, $3.5 million from the federal government, half a million dollars from the state. As we dug into the ground, we found souls. Soul. Somebody had taken and used souls as landfill. I know it's hard to believe Chelsea had used landfill, and we dug through 10,000 square feet of souls. So uh, I'm not. Maybe that's the case. Hello, I'm, my name is Rich Baldwin. I'm an environmental scientist and a resiliency expert with Ramble, and we work all up and down the uh, coast of Massachusetts. Okay, based on where? Um, Boston is our local office. And I guess the thing is, is obviously dredging is an economic engine for Massachusetts. Obviously, it has been for a long time. Yep. And it's not just the big ports like New Bedford. It's the small facilities such as Swampscott trying to maintain and uh, you know, commercial fisheries, bringing in larger transient boats, uh, et cetera. I guess the big thing is we'd like to see the Commonwealth spend more money on dredging uh, as much as we can get. <laughs> and so yeah. it's a, it's, I, I think it's besides the public safety, it's just the economic driver yeah. okay. for a lot. Thanks. This is the place where uh, you have his there's a, there's own line. Lie is figure and figure is lie. Good news is we're spending 400% more than we did last year. Bad news is that that isn't a lot of money. So um, we recognize that there's a huge need out there, and we're going to try to figure that out. Um, I'm in the city of Beverly, so I'll just talk about Beverly. Uh, Beverly is asking us for money to rebuild ramps on Route 128 uh, to do local roadways to help uh, create shopping centers and uh, economic development around there. Um, money to support downtown activities, including me going to a and restaurant all the time. <laughs> and dredging. So at the end of the day, there's a finite amount, there is a finite amount of money. But the governor, uh, with the support of the legislature, has said that this is a priority. I can't go to the governor right now and say that I should have five million or ten million or twenty million because the governor's first question is, Jay, what's the plan? So you all are helping to form that plan. We're going to have a great plan, and then uh, the Secretary of uh, Environmental Affairs and I uh, will go to the governor and say this is what we think the plan needs to be, and then we'll get the support of the legislature to help us out that. Anyone else is standing? Uh, <clears throat> David Jelano, a resident of Beverly. Um, I just want to say. 10 years for the permitting, and you talked about the process. It wasn't because the city lost interest. Yeah, it's 10 it's years, outrageous. and the very departments that are charged with protecting these rivers, I said at one point, why don't you let us pave it over? I mean, they're going to lose these rivers. You make it so hard, and everyone goes, oh my god. But think about where the river is. You know, a few years idea. ago, there was a pipe that let go. Some dirt fell in the river. The sensible thing is you have an excavator there, take out what you just fell in there, but you can't. And so how crazy is that? And so the river has choked itself, choked itself, and choked itself off. I know there's regulations and I know there's requirements, but it, it, it's very difficult for people to get these projects done. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Streamlining is an important part. We've already started a discussion about that, and it's a priority of the governor is, is to take things that are taking too long. Mm -hmm. Anyone been to the registry lately? <laughs> All right, so you read the registry lately. So I'm, I'm going to be off by a little bit, but but two years ago, if you went to the registry, you had a 75% chance of waiting an hour. Um, how long did you wait? 
No. That's not the correct answer. What community are you from? All right, well, we've done, uh, uh, other than his problem, uh, we have something like 90% 90, 90 of the people are getting in outside of, uh, inside of half an hour, in and out inside of half an hour. And so the governor looks at these things and says, we get a shot in the process. We've already begun the discussion with DEA about the different agencies that are involved, and we're talking, thinking through to, for those of you who are on conservation commissions, could we do something that works at the conservation level, that works at the state level, that also works at the federal level? Other people with a standing effect? Uh, John Walkie with Chelsea Greenroots and Roseanne says hello. Um, and just, I think it's been addressed a couple times. People have talked about the dredging. So, in the case where it's not um, uh, something you can sell to communities in terms of replenishing beaches, but it's coming from a former industrial port mm -hmm. and it's contaminated, and we mentioned CAD cells. Allegedly contaminated. Allegedly contaminated. Yeah. Um, so it, to the degree that things can be kept in the place where that economic activity is happening and not brought like the economic activity is brought to this place that gets dredged and then the burden gets put someplace else, to the degree that it's transparent and we know uh, where the dredgings are going uh, and that people are aware of this and that it, there's um, some openness. There's been people talking about CAD cells. I don't, as far as I know, they're all in you know, open federal waters um, and we haven't seen too many on private uh, privately held properties or in the state's properties, so to the degree that yeah, they can be done. The question is whether you want them to be done and who keeps that liability and the maintenance of them. So those kinds of issues need to be brought to the fore and to be on the table so it's calculated in with the benefits and the costs associated with some of the dredgings as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anyone else standing? All right, we're back to uh, next. Oh, you guys, you had your hand up, right? <coughs> so as uh, people are getting up, um, Mayor, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, as uh, people are getting up, uh, we're going to have an hour left here, a few more people to speak. So if you could uh, uh, make sure that I understand the safety part of it, um, very important. If we can uh, be adding new things to the discussion, that would be great. Don't need to be the first time. Hi, I'm Mike Miller from the uh, Newton Yacht Club. And I'd just like to put in a word for the Charles River. Uh, the upper portion of the Charles River is getting relentlessly filled in from what I understand is runoff from the Mass Pike. Uh, the drains run directly into the, uh, the Charles up there and sand comes off the, the pike and into the river. Uh, there are two yacht <laughs> clubs up in that area and an enormous community rowing program. Uh, which puts in hundreds of rowers uh, uh, on the weekends. Uh, last year when we had the mini drought, the uh, chase boats were getting stuck in the sand because it's, it's to that level. Uh, literally the water in front of the Newton Yacht Club is three feet deep. And that's a dramatic change from five, ten years ago. So just a, just a word of support for Charles River. Okay, great, thank you. Were you what, Sam? Okay, come on up, and then I'm going to go to the row here next, okay? So whoever, uh, does that somebody in this row, you can get up, uh, be right behind her, and then be great. Hi, I'm Kathy Abbott. I live in Beverly. I live at the very end of Water Street, next to the boat ramp at the mouth of the Danvers River. And whenever anybody talks about dredging, I get nervous because I've never seen a dredging project around here that didn't affect the water quality of the harbor and it can happen really quickly um, the and particularly because in Beverly we have a history up the river of uh, radioactive waste of lead and all of the chemicals from the old um, old um, leather factories and everything that was up there and when you start dredging you're going deeper and deeper into things that haven't been touched before potentially so my concern is when a dredging project starts and all of a sudden my dog won't go in the water because yeah. it's too nasty, you know, um, there's got to be something in place to, to deal with that. The, uh, like a week and a half ago, they shut down. I got the idea, if I could ask you, we get a couple of people, so I got the idea. If you want to Can I finish, please? Yeah. 
A week and a half ago, they shut down the Independence Park because of bacterial waste, yeah. okay? What typically happens is somebody comes out and tests it, they take it up to Gloucester, there's a turnaround time of like 24 hours, and so you don't know that it's bad water till 24 hours later. Yeah. So what I'm asking is, if you have a bad storm that comes through when you're dredging, and I don't care what it is, whether it's chemicals or, or you know, bacteria, whatever, yeah. is there a quicker way that we can get notice that that water is bad? Okay. That's my concern. Right, thank you. Thanks. Right down this road, next. Thank you for coming. For people that are leaving, thank you for being here. Right. My name is Kevin Desmond. Uh, our family owns uh, the property at 60 River Street between National Grid site and Monaghan Lumber. Uh, in uh, 1980, we developed a full service yacht yard. Uh, we uh, provided a, uh, the largest travel lift north of Boston to lift uh, boats out of the water for service. Um, we were affected by the Beverly Salem Bridge because a lot of our customers had sailboats in excess of 60 feet. Obviously, the masts are very, very tall. So in order for them to get into the river, they had to wait for the tide to go down to get under the bridge. Then they had to tie up to a float and then wait for the tide to come up so they could get down the river so we could pull them out and do the work. Um, so we've been impacted by, by the, uh, the filling in of the river yeah, the significantly. The story, so you're yes, yes, exactly. And um, many of uh, the customers that are there today who have fairly large boats, um, they have to put in and go down the river and go to other yacht clubs or <coughs> facilities to have their masts stepped in because they can't get under the bridge because they're still too big, but they can only get down the river when it's high tide because when they're drawing in so much water. Yeah. The other issue is, um, uh, with the Bass River, this, uh, we talked about uh, dredge spoils earlier in, in the evening. Um, north of the bridge, most of that can be dumped at sea. South of National Grid's property can be dumped out at the dumping grounds. But the portion in front of National Grid and that goes right across the front of our um, property has to be uh, excavated out and put into land and has to be trucked away. So. Uh, they're responsible for that, that cost, and their, their share of uh, dredging approximately 850 lineal feet across all the way up to the bridge. So uh, that, that impacts us because our property abuts their property and the contamination that was on their property was put into ours and also in, our, uh, in the upland portion, also in the river. So we're very concerned about uh, them dragging their feet because they, they have, because they, they're not interested in dredging anything okay. at this point. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Rowe, anyone else? Ms. Rowe, next row. Yeah. I really do appreciate everyone coming. Uh, uh, again, another thing that's been very helpful. Good evening, Bill McHugh, Salem Harbor Master. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk about dredging. Um, I'd like to talk about America's uh, Maritime Highway. Um, Salem is a perfect community uh, that already participates in what is commonly called short sea shipping. Uh, they've made significant investments in the upland services area. Um, they've also, uh, including the purchase of a uh, fast ferry back in 06, which is a successful venture. Um, one thing Salem is, it's a perfect uh, community for mixed use. It, it's currently uh, a vibrant mixed use port. Uh, we do have, uh, from a recent uh, redevelopment, shared access to a deep water berth, which could be so much more um, from shared uh, special project cargoes coming up, uh, increased uh, passenger vessel activity. We are fortunate enough to attract cruise ships now, but we could be more with a little bit of dredging in the basin. Uh, the basin is where the ships turn to come off the dock. The federal channel supports the uh, activity uh, for large ships with no air draft, plenty of deep draft. The berth itself accommodates uh, larger ships, but the turning base is tight, and we've gotten a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, comments from captains coming in and out. And again, America's Maritime Highway, it takes the load off the, the, the roads. It takes your load off of I-95. It, it is successful. Uh, maritime uh, transportation is the cheapest, most efficient way to uh, move goods. Um, the other part of that is, and, and my recreational boaters have talked about that, down in the South River area it has shoaled up, and that is a, a classic mixed use area. You have uh, multiple excursion uh, vessels that go in and out of there, along with pleasure craft, and that is a safety concern. I know you've heard a lot about it, but the channel's gotten so shoaled up and so narrow that you're having interaction, you know, 
not the good kind between commercial and recreational vessels. So the, uh, the city does have a, a uh, harbor plan and they've worked actively and they're gonna go ahead and amend that harbor plan as well as they go to, to identify uh, different projects. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ron Bourne with uh, GI Consultants. And really, uh, we've had the experience and fortunate to work for several communities, both North Shore and South Shore on their dredging projects. And really what I want to bring back is the, just the, the interfacing that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis and thinking that there is ways that, that we've talked about them here tonight, but more, uh, just to reinforce that, is better cooperation uh, and uh, co-permitting uh, with the federal agencies. Yeah. Other states do it, you know, <laughs> much more aligned. Is there somebody you point to say? Well, I think, uh, you know, New York has a better way of dealing with intermeshing the different agencies. Okay. Connecticut seems to work well in that regard in some of the projects we worked on down there. So there's ways to get that to work better uh, from that. I think the issue with that comes uh, all the associated things uh, around, especially dredging. We run into this issue with biological, the $100,000 plus type testing. One, if you're gonna do it, let's find ways to make sure that life of that testing gets extended because EPA, you know, saying three years, you know, maybe more, whatever, but somehow, you know, we've certainly had to do uh, ways to do it, but a more formalized approach to that because it seems to be a little bit helter skelter, you know, when uh, they say, oh, you gotta go do another, do a biological round of testing, which all of a sudden now you're a 100,000 plus uh, investment yeah. again. And you still haven't got the point of actually doing any work from that. Uh, I think the other thing we see is it seems like every time we turn around, there's another regulatory condition that gets put on the table. <laughs> so it's stacked up, you know, it just keeps going up and up and it makes it more and more difficult. Certainly a lot of it is on the federal level. I mean, it's not just state, uh, but it's all there. And I think it just needs part of uh, a cooperation between the state and federal on how you're gonna implement it. Because sometimes these get laid on without identification of mitigation. They say, you gotta do this now, you gotta mitigate. Well, how will you mitigate? We don't know, you tell us. It's like, what are we doing here, guys, from that? So that needs to be worked out. It needs to be economical mitigation from that. Um, one of the things I don't see, and, and I've, you know, after 40 years in the industry, uh, and it's difficult to go to the regulatory agencies and whine and complain about this or that because you're asking them to approve, you know, your permit, your approval, whatever. Which seems to me there should be a third party group that sort of interfaces so that communities and consultants and whoever can work through them to work with agencies as a third party so that we don't have a direct uh, 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 you know, conflict, if you will. Appreciate the perspective, but it isn't a problem that we have in this administration, so just keep on electing Governor Baker. And <laughs> but, so a more formalized approach so we know who to go to to say, can we do something about this yeah. type of thing? Yeah, uh, we're open right now. I can't guarantee future administrations, but you know, uh, uh, one of the first acts that Governor Baker did was uh, did a comprehensive review of the 2,000 regulations. We have roughly 2,000. We amended or eliminated two thirds of them. Every business, every regulation that exists now, we have a, uh, a business uh, um, uh, impact plan uh, statement for each one of them. So we very much believe in regulation reform. We have a, a number of regulations. And in terms of thick skins, I mean, you know, we, we're not thin skin. We, uh, we're, I'd, I'd rather have people kick me in the rear end. Than uh, so finally, I just, you know, going back to the issue of uh, why, we, why we haven't dredged before. Yeah. It's not that we haven't tried, okay? okay. It's either it's regulatory. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, we, there was, you know, DM Waterways was leading a lot of that for the communities. Yeah. It was, in my sense of looking at it, efficient that way but recognize it was a state funded uh, project and it was community uh, participation with that. If that's the kind of mechanism, that's not a, a, a bad way to go, but I don't know if it works in today's world. It's certainly for the last you know, 20, 30 years, everything's been pushed away and more and more to the communities or the private sector, whoever it is. But to me, that's one of the, the reasons is, is that and the regulatory problems because uh, coming into the 80s, uh, 90s, it just seemed like there's a number of projects that got forward, got hit, hit the wall of permitting and what had to be overcome and just said, we, we, we give up, yeah. you know, and okay, 20 years later, we try again. 
Thank, that. You. Thank you. Question for Mr. Boyd. Yeah, just go ahead, guys. Or um, I'm waiting for the next person to speak. Right. Um, Anyone on the end? Would you yeah. address in Farmers exactly where the Yabi permit is for the best work? Uh, well, after much t uh, time uh, and almost a requirement to do pre-biological testing, we have gone back, got the tier one approval. It's now in the final stages of getting core approval. So uh, there's some issues of resolving uh, minimal items around the mitigation, but it's, it's there. Hi, Jay. Thanks. Jim Bartlett, Commercial Fisherman in Beverly in the Bass River. I just want to say if it wasn't for me and my brother, and my two sons and my nephew going in and out of that river every single day, half the boats north of that bridge wouldn't be moving. From the 1st of April to the 1st of February, almost seven days a week, we kick that mud around and it keeps it open. Next thing, you mentioned 128 and ramps. You're responsible for that mess up there on 128 and 62? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Anyone else on this side? Anyone else? Go ahead. Affordable housing. Affordable housing votes. Did you get some money? Yeah. You know what? You're an innovator. Anyone else? All right. Who hasn't been heard that wants to be heard? I'm going to ask uh, Senator Tarr. You want to wrap us up here? Sure. Uh, Thank you, thank you, everyone. Senator Tarr, uh, uh, I, I have the pleasure of working uh, very closely with the legislators and uh, uh, picking on no particular person, but I'll ask uh, the senior senator. In the area. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. I don't know if that's good about. First of all, just a couple of quick points. Number one, thank you for coming out and doing this. Obviously, there's tremendous interest in our region in getting this I'm done. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Thank what? Thank <laughs> yeah, did, uh, do, you, do you want to talk about the registry now, too? But anyway. <laughs> Um, me with my <laughs> when you get done with dredging, you're going to wish you were doing 128 off ramps. That's all I'm going to tell you. Um, so first of all, I put together a little briefing document for you um, about all the issues that are going on here and the partnerships. I do want to point out a couple of quick things. One, our legislative delegation works extremely well together. We're united in this effort. And we want to be helpful and, and work with you in any way that we can. Two. I cannot emphasize regional collaboration. And the reason I was holding my tongue back there is in 2008, we started the Merrimack River Beach Alliance to get the Merrimack River dredged. And we first wanted to buy a dredge. We found out that was impractical. It was easier, believe it or not, to convince the Army Corps to do the job, and we cost shared. Okay. Now, here's the important point in that. The only option with the Army Corps is not just having them do the job. They will contract for capacity, particularly for the dredge known as the Caratuck, which comes up our way periodically. So we don't need to necessarily buy equipment. Okay. We can buy that capacity. Number two, Merrimack River Beach Alliance meets once a month. Everyone is at the table. Everyone. Local state officials, you're welcome to come. I cannot tell you how effective the Office of Coastal Zone Management has been at those meetings, as well as the partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers. They said we wouldn't get the Merrimack River uh, dredged. We dredged 160,000 cubic yards of sand, put it on the beaches, cost share to do it, got it done. We're going to do it again in the next two to five years. That kind of regional collaboration is essential. What are we doing now? We're taking the lessons we learned at NMRBA, and we founded the Northeast Coastal Coalition, Cape Ann to New Hampshire. Same model, same reason. Our congressional partners have signaled to us that is the only way to try to get the leverage we need to move forward with the federal government. Everybody comes to the table, from conservation commissions all the way to the chief people at the Army Corps of Engineers. And when we don't get results, we go to Washington and we get results. So I wanted to tell you about that and, and let you know that in terms of some issues that have been discussed here already, mobilization costs, when they're shared, it greatly reduces the cost. Disposal costs. We have a lot of ways to move sand around in this particular region that can be beneficial. It was referenced. Essex is piloting thin layer deposition. The idea of building coastal marsh resiliency by using some of the dredge spoils. A lot of different things that we can do. So I want to point that out. The one thing I have to stress here, number one, is we collaborate as legislators. Dredge projects happen, in my experience, only when there is collaboration between every stakeholder involved. At the MRBA, we have nonprofit organizations. At NECC, we're inviting nonprofit organizations. We all sit at the table, and that way you don't have a situation where somebody raised an issue, you've got to go find somebody else to get it addressed. Everybody sits at the table. Documentation here on how the process has worked, 
all of the agencies that have been involved, and some thoughts about how we can expand the effort. So thank you. This is the first hope a lot of us have had in a very long time. We need the state to get involved. There's more than one way for the state to get involved. We can have a tremendous partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers, and we can get these projects moving. I agree. Thank you very much. I agree. I'm going to leave them here if anybody wants one. $10 a copy, we'll put the money towards Dredge. We're going to use it for Dredge. Secretary, I just want to thank you and the administration for having this listening for us. Thank you for coming to the morning. This is very, very helpful. Yep. It's a horrible sign when somebody comes from Maine or New Hampshire or wherever sure. to start their intercoastal trip. They come into the Ennisquam River and they're discouraged right away. Mm -hmm. So just in that effort, in terms of safety, I believe safety comes first, the environmental issues done. On that list should be worrying. Yep. And the fact that we're sending people away when they don't find their river ways yep. to be hospitable. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So everyone, thank you. Uh, this has been extremely helpful. Uh, we'll stay in touch with the legislators. If anyone has a, uh, an idea that they want to send me, send me an email. Appreciate your time tonight. Thanks all for coming. Yes, thank you very much. That's really How are you? Well, thank you.